Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. I'm Terry McKegg. I'm chairman of the uh, select board here in Williston. And the uh, first uh, thing that was on our agenda is the, the presentation of the colors. Williston Troop 692 Boy Scouts uh, will conduct the presentation of the colors. And if you'd all please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Color Guard, dismiss. <coughs> Please be seated. The troop has had an exciting this year in that about two weeks ago, they had a, a card of honor uh, inaugurating four new Eagle Scouts into the troop. So they are a, a good presence in the town. This year, the town report is dedicated to two retiring public figures, Deb Beckett and Rick McGuire, uh, our town manager and Deb's our town clerk and treasurer, as you know. We owe them a great debt of data to, gratitude for their ongoing service and over the years and uh, wish them well in their uh, retirements. So tonight, uh, tomorrow, Deb will be retiring as clerk treasurer after the, uh, the election uh, as her term is expiring. And at this time, I'd invite uh, Representative Jim McCullough to join me here at the uh, podium if he's available. I think he's still checking people in. Oh, here, here he comes. <laughs> so tonight we have a resolution from the legislature <coughs> honoring Deb. This is House Concurrent Resolution honoring Williston Town Clerk Deborah Beckett for her outstanding municipal public service. It's offered by representatives McCullough and McKegg, and by Senators Ingram and Lyons. Whereas, Deb Beckett has served the state of Vermont with distinction as a twice deployed member of the Vermont Army National Guard. And whereas, she has held many appointed or elected Williston town offices, including Lister, Justice of the Peace, town agent, town grand juror, cemetery commissioner, and member of the Development Review Board. And whereas, for the past two decades, Deb Beckett has served as a respected Williston town clerk, and her professional colleagues have elected her to leadership roles at the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and the Vermont Clerks and Treasurers Association. And whereas, as Deb Beckett concludes, concludes her duties as town clerk, the town of Williston is dedicating its 2019 town report in her honor. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives but the General Assembly honors Williston Town Clerk Deborah Beckett for her outstanding municipal public service, and be it further resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to send a copy of this resolution to Deb Beckett. And being frugal, we have the resolution to present to Deb tonight. <clears throat> Terry, uh, 
It has truly been an honor and a privilege to have had the opportunity to serve the community of Williston for these past 21 years, says town clerk and treasurer. There is no career on this planet that is better. And this is truly a unique community. Um, and it is, it's the epitome of what a hometown is. And for that, I thank you all very much. <laughs> also in the town report, uh, we pay tribute uh, to, um, as an in memoriam to people who have passed away who have been serving the town over a long period of time. And in our town, town report, John Hines, a longtime select board member, and a former town manager, Paul McGinley, are honored in our town report. So at this time, I'd like to introduce the select board. And uh, immediately on my right, after Sarah, is uh, Ken T T Ted Kenny. Next to him is Joy Limoges, our vice chair, and then Gordon St. Hilaire and Jeff Fares. So now we'll start the actual business of the, of the meeting and do um, Article 1 to elect a moderator. Are there nominations for the position of moderator? Jim McCullough. Honor to, um, to nominate Tony Lamb. Thank you. Is there a second? Second from Dead Beckett. Are there any further nominations for moderator? Seeing no other nominations, all in favor of electing Tony Lamb, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. Tony, Tony, it's all up to you. I want you to know I heard the sighs of disappointment when you realized you hadn't elected Anthony Lamb, the basketball player, as moderator. <laughs> the confusion is understandable because he's from Rochester, New York, and I was born in Rochester, New York. But the real different, the real true matches are we both have the same athletic build and grace of movement. <laughs> the difference is he can hit a three-point shot. Article two, shall the voters authorize the current taxes to be paid to the town treasurer in three equal installments with due dates of August 15th, November 15th, and February 15th as authorized by 32 VSA, section 4871. Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Is it been moved and seconded? Any discussion? All those in favor of article two to set the uh, Payment of taxes and the tax date signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Article three, to hear and act upon the reports of the several town officers. Do I have a motion to accept the reports and then we'll hear the reports? So we have a motion, a second? Okay. Yes. Arthur Ramsey. Town manager. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> I wanted to take a few minutes uh, to talk about some of the accomplishments that we had this past year. Um, there's been a lot of activities since last town meeting, and we've had a number of successes. And of course, not everything has gone to, according to plan. I'm gonna take this opportunity to talk about some of these successes, but also some of the things that didn't quite work out the way we had planned. And in the interest of transparency, I provided some visual cues for you to, uh, you can figure out which one I'm referring to, the positive or the negative. So first off, we have another retirement, and that is the fire chief. Ken Morton, our chief, has been with the department for 38 years, and he's been chief for 25 of those 38 years. And, and so I indicated sideway arrows because I wasn't quite sure which way to indicate. I think from Ken's standpoint, it's definitely an up. Uh, from our standpoint, um, we obviously have mixed feelings. Um, he's been a great leader and, and we'll certainly miss uh, him as part of um, our town services and government. So Ken, best of luck in retirement. And of course, <laughs> oh, yeah.
And of course, you heard that Deb Beckett is also retiring. Uh, she's been town clerk and treasurer for the past 21 years. And as you heard, she's served a, a variety of other positions within the town. And we certainly wish her the best of luck in retirement as well. So we have a, uh, a new person, which I'm going to definitely give it a, a thumbs up on. Uh, that is our um, town clerk, or I'm sorry, <laughs> a town library director, uh, Jane Kearns. And she started working in November, and I believe she's back there. So if you can wave your hand. and. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jane. We're, we're thrilled to have her working in our library now. And, of course, we also had some awards that were given. Uh, this is a picture of our assistant town clerk, and possibly soon to be regular town clerk, depending on the election tomorrow, but we won't go there. Um, this, uh, she was awarded the uh, assistant town clerk of the year in recognition of her dedication, professionalism, and leadership in the town. Uh, Sarah Mason uh, was, as I said, selected as assistant town clerk of the year. Congratulations, Sarah. Not to be outdone, we had Firefighter of the Year. Uh, this is uh, Anthony Samanskis. He's been with her, I've, how long has he been with us? 11 years. 11 years. Uh, he was selected as firefighter based on, again, his professionalism, and this was a statewide award, so we are thrilled and honored to have Tony working for us and receiving that award. So on to other serious, more serious matters here. Um, this report was uh, entitled Towns in Trouble, and it was a report that was completed by the Ethan Allen Institute, which is actually a conservative think tank. Uh, they did a survey of the 30 most popular, populous towns, maybe popular too, but populous towns in Vermont, and they looked at the financial health of those 30 populous communities. And they used a, var a range of different measurements to determine um, the financial status of those communities. They signed a score to each community based on uh, one, a scale of 1 to 100, 100 being the best perfect score, and 1 being obviously the lowest. Now, I've given this an up hour because Williston scored quite well. In fact, we scored 92 out of 100. And the lowest score, by the way, was 22. And I won't mention which town that was. Um, but we were the highest score of all 30 communities, and we're obviously very proud of that. So as I said, everything hasn't been quite rosy, and this is a photograph of a um, problem we had out in Mountain View Road. This is from a storm that occurred this past Halloween. It was a major storm event, and it's a storm event that caused damage to private property and public property as well. Uh, this being uh, some public property. Uh, what had happened here is the water had gone kind of instead of just going through the culvert, went around it, scoured out all the dirt, and then caused a big um, cavity to form uh, underneath the road, which obviously made the road unsafe to pass on. Our public works crew, um, did the repair work, and we had the road open within a couple days. So we're happy that that was uh, a success. Later on, I'll talk about one that wasn't quite as successful. We also continue to have a, a huge uh, social media presence. Uh, on the positive side, um, we have um, always had a, a web page that's been very uh, full of content, and it's content we keep up to date. We do numerous postings on Front Porch Forum. We've had a, a TV show that's currently um, shows about once a month. Our assistant town manager, Eric Wells, uh, is the um, producer of that program and the guest and host and everything else. Um, he has done a great job of addressing a variety of different topics of community interest. And it's called What's Up Williston, and it, you can find it on YouTube. I think we have our own YouTube channel, and the, there's a link to it from the town's web page. You can also like us on Facebook, tweet us on Twitter, and as I said, subscribe on YouTube. And, uh, and I also don't want um, people to forget, we have uh, what we call a customer service portal that's available on the town's front page of our website. 
Uh, if you have a, uh, a problem you see, like a pothole or a street light that's out, do you want to report it to the town? You can do it right online, any time of the day or night. You can send photographs, you can send all kinds of information, and that goes directly to the people responsible for addressing that. And uh, it's a very useful tool, and I encourage everyone to use it if you do find some things that, uh, where you need a town service. So we tried uh, an experiment of traffic calming on North Wilston Road. And uh, I will say that it was very successful in slowing traffic down. It was also very successful in annoying the nearby residents. Uh, and that's from all the trucks that were rolling over it and causing a ruckus. Um, so in the end, we did remove this device because it was a temporary device that we tried out on the road. And so we're going to have to look at other measures, um, perhaps even uh, some sort of um, uh, a little speed table or something as a possibility, but not quite one of this nature. Now, we have a new program. That, this isn't quite... Um, consistent with my report on past activities because it's a program that's just now starting up. In fact, I heard today that we will be getting our first dog and um, starting in May, I think. So this is a, um, a new program uh, where th that's going to be run through our police department. They're going to be acquiring a Labrador um, retriever, and it's going to be trained as a therapy slash comfort dog. Uh, it'll be used for people um, who have gone through traumatic events, perhaps they're a victim of crime, and it's, it's a source of possible comfort to those individuals. And I would say that this is uh, one more step in a series of steps that we've been taking over the years to really change the nature of our police department. Um, it's more about, it's, it's not just about trying to catch the bad guys, it's also about dealing with the people who are victims of crime. And for many years now, we've had a community justice program that's been very, very active. And we also have, uh, more recently, the establishment of a community outreach program that's on a regional basis. And now we will have a comfort dog as well. So we're very excited to get that program underway, and I think people will find it very useful. After all, who can resist hugging a cute dog? And finally, we are probably our biggest accomplishment this past year was the acquisition of the Catamount Community Forest. Um, and largely, this is land that we purchased from uh, Lucy and Jim McCullough. The forest amounts to about 393 acres of absolutely beautiful land. And it was purchased using a variety of sources, including federal, state, money, some private donations, and of course, town money as well. People are free to hike on it. Uh, so if they so choose, they can snowshoe on it. Um, and if they're interested in more organized activities, there is a uh, nonprofit organization called the Catamount Outdoor Family Center that offers a wide range of activities, including cross-country skiing, and bicyclists and runners in the summertime. And with that, I will conclude this brief little report on the town activities, and I'll be happy to answer any questions anyone might have on these reports. Yes, sir. When is uh, Chief Morton's last day? Uh, July 8th, I think. July 8th. <clears throat> the question was, when was Chief Morton's last day? Any other questions? If not, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. All those in favor of accepting the report signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Article four, excuse me, article four, to discuss whether the town should maintain all public sidewalks and paved recreation paths during the winter months. No vote will be taken. Interesting. So, um, Eric, you had a presentation. So the assistant town manager is going to give us a brief overview. Good evening, everyone. So I'm here to talk about Article 4 this evening. Um, looking 
as uh, the moderator said, it's for discussion only. So I'll start giving you a broad overview and also look at some options for service here before we open up for discussion this evening. Oh, I shouldn't skip over the piece of equipment here. So that's our sidewalk plow. Um, I took this photo during the storm we had in February recently. Everyone probably remembers that when it was snowing one to two inches per hour. It was, it was quite the storm we had that day. So setting the stage here, there are nearly 30 miles of sidewalk and recreation paths in town. We currently plow about 10 and a quarter miles of those with that sidewalk plow that, that you saw pictured. We also have about five and a quarter miles of recreation paths that we plow with a pickup truck. At least about 14 miles of public sidewalk that's not plowed in town. We have one plow to maintain the sidewalks here. And as you saw, it's quite the piece of equipment. We have a, a plow blade on it, and we can also attach a blower to it if we get an excessive amount of snow we need to move. Right now, it takes about five hours to plow these 10 miles of sidewalks during a four inch snowstorm. So as you can see, when we get a larger snowstorm, it will take more time to, to do that work. Under our winter operations policy, our town highways are plowed first and then our sidewalks are plowed. Right now, our town policy has requests for added sidewalk segments to be plowed to go for the select board each December to hear these requests for possible inclusion in our winter operations plan for the following winter. Um, this policy has general criteria for consideration and discussion. There's no um, scoring or, or rating system for, for adding segments right now. So next we'll have a visual. Um, hopefully this is familiar to folks. It's a map of uh, a section of our town. It's showing where the sidewalks and paths are. Um, I know it's probably a little hard to see, especially in the back of the room. I'll, I'll just go over the, the legend here with the color coding. So the pink color are sidewalks and paths that we currently plow. Um, you, you can see a number of those around town representing those 10 miles. The yellow shading are the recreational paths that we also plow with a pickup truck. So these segments in orange highlighted are sidewalks that we currently do not plow that are, that are active in town here. Um, I know it's a little challenging to see. Um, I can, if someone is interested in getting a copy of this, please let me know after the meeting. I can share that with you. And when we get to the discussion, we can pull this map up as well to take another look at it. So the discussion this evening is gonna focus around what level of service should the town provide for winter sidewalk um, and recreational path maintenance. So to get this started, I'm gonna go through kind of a broad spectrum of, of possible options to consider before I turn it back to our moderator. So one thing we can look to do, and I wanna preface these numbers, this isn't in our current FY21 budget proposal. These are numbers to think about if the town were to take on this level of service in the future. To plow all side sidewalks in town, we need a second piece of equipment. We're at capacity right now, pretty close to what a single plow can handle. Our current cost for sidewalk plowing, this 10 and a quarter miles, is just under $17,000 each winter. The added cost would be for new equipment and its operation. We have a part-time position in our public works department that would operate the second plow. So how much does a sidewalk plow cost? It's approximately $130,000 for this piece of equipment. If we were to go ahead and move to get this in the short term, we look at something called a lease purchase arrangement to finance it. The equipment and operational cost for the second plow, we estimate is about $43,000 a year for the first five years for this lease purchase agreement. So the cost to maintain the 24 and a quarter miles of sidewalks is about $60,000 a winter right now. Um, based on our, on our estimates of what a winter usually looks like. The recreational pass we spoke of, the cost for that is around $3,000. So the tax rate impact, if we, based on our current grand list value, the additional $43,000 to the budget will result in about a 0 .002 cent tax rate increase. Or you could think about it, $2 for every $100,000 of assessed property value. So another option here, kind of the other end of the spectrum, is minimum plowing. Um, the town could put an ordinance or policy in place that shifts primary responsibility to main sidewalks to the adjacent property owners. Under Vermont law, ordinances could 
provide for the removal of snow and ice from sidewalks by the owner, occupant, or person having charge of the abutting property. The town under the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, has a legal responsibility to ensure its sidewalks are ADA compliant, keeping them in an accessible condition with allowances for isolated or temporary interruptions. At most, the town could penalize a property owner under an ordinance with a fine for not removing snow, but it, means the legal ob it remains the legal obligation of the town to keep the sidewalks accessible. Across the lake in Plattsburgh, New York, for example, um, they use this approach. It requires property owners to shovel their adjacent sidewalk to some degree within a defined period of time, and other communities around the country have something similar in place as well. So those are kind of two ends here. There's also carry on as we are right now. We could maintain our current practice and allow a request to be reviewed annually by the select board using our policy um, in December. And then the quantity of sidewalks, as I mentioned, is really reaching that critical capacity for a single piece of equipment. Um, if segments beyond a minimal amount were to be added, we'd also need to think about whether it makes sense for level of service using that one, one machine is, is adequate still at that point. And another point to go along with that, with one piece of equipment, if something were to happen to that piece of equipment and, and break down, we don't have a backup in place. And um, you know, hopefully it's something that could be repaired quickly, but you never know sometimes. <laughs> then our, our last look here is what I'm calling a hybrid approach. Uh, I've kind of gone through different pieces of the spectrum of service here. And also as we get into discussion, interested in, in everyone's voice, um, we could develop a strategy that blends elements of sidewalk maintenance service um, that I've previously discussed. There's a number, number of variables to consider. We could plow additional sidewalks in certain areas of town. We could share some responsibility with property owners with, with a fee for service or a grant model. Um, or also look at the town's policy and consider possible amendments to that and that system for evaluating um, additional segments of sidewalk to add each winter. So I think I've spoken enough on this topic to start. I'd be happy to hand it back over to our moderator for discussion here. Um, I'm hearing a number of other staff members to answer questions on this topic as we get into the discussion. Okay. Back to you, Tony, thanks. Questions, comments, concern, yes. Did you look into the option of contracting for additional sidewalk removal? Did you look into the question of contracting for additional removal? Why don't you stay up here? Uh, we didn't ex explore that in detail yet, Chapin. I know um, it's something we, we can look at, but with the town's overall responsibility to maintain the sidewalks, we'd, we'd want to be really careful about contracting and, and making sure um, insurance and those items as well. I raised the question just because you might have more control that over a contractor than you do over an individual property owner shoveling their walk, and it might be a middle ground. Other questions, comments, or concerns? Yes, Chief. So, just so I'm clear, Eric, sorry. So, currently we're paying something. And if we go with the all options, it's going to cost $64 for a $300,000 home per year. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. What's the hybrid? A couple dollars per $300,000, $3? Yeah, I think it would depend where the service level's at it. So, it's all. It's all based upon what model we use, if it was a different fee-for-service model. But kind of the rub here is needing the additional piece of equipment. So we're really at that critical mass of one piece of equipment. So if we need to purchase that second piece of equipment, the large chunk of that $43,000 is the initial debt service for at least purchase um, for that. Thank you. Yes. Back. Oh, uh, what brought about this? Uh this topic in the first place, have there been um, requests or complaints of any sort? And then the second question is, does the plowing, is there wear and tear, more wear and tear on a sidewalk if it's plowed? You know, the, like for instance, like would there be additional cost to the sidewalk over time with plowing? Thanks, Andy. The uh, select board hears these requests each December. There, there's usually one or two each year. And the select board in reviewing the requests this past December decided to put this on the warning for town meeting to, to have a broader discussion when we have a number of members of the community here to, to think about this issue. Um, for the wear and tear question, I'll, I'll turn that over to our Assistant Public Works Director, Lisa Schaefer. 
As for the wear and tear of the sidewalks with the snow plow machine, most of the time it's the wear and tear and the damage that is done is to the grass stripped areas on both sides of the sidewalk. We don't, as you can tell when you walk around town, we don't go down to bare, bare sidewalk when we plow. We can, but we don't usually because there's so much snow that has to be moved. And along that same point, um, we, Eric had mentioned we have a snowblower attachment that we can have connected to this same plow. And we need to utilize that when the snow banks get so high that when we're just plowing through, the snow goes right back in behind us as soon as we go through there. And the snow blower option increases that five hour plow time for the sidewalks. Yes. Uh, with the ADA requirement that we plow these sidewalks, how can we take the uh, uh, do nothing uh, option? So I, I can speak to what I've seen in other communities that have that in place. For example, Plattsburgh, um, if, if someone was not able to to plow or shovel out in front of their property, they would have a waiver request. Um, it, that's the way that community um, handles that. But the most the town could do is, is find someone. Um, the town would ultimately need to make sure they were accessible and passable. Are you still talking about individual persons, not the town is required to plow all the sidewalks? That's what you're ADA does not require the town to follow a button. It requires you to provide accessibility to a person who needs it. Is that what you're saying? Um, I, I'm not an expert on the ins and outs of it, but I, from reading what state law requires, that they need to be, sidewalk needs to be passable for, for access. For the ADA individual? No, he, 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 he he's suggesting that by requiring the homeowner to clear the walk in front, it might relieve the town from that obligation. And the ADA comes into play when you have a homeowner who can't show up with a walk. Okay. And if they take care of them, then they fill that gap. So you said that way. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying that ADA is not required the town to plow all sidewalks? It requires them to have it clear. True. How they clear is it? And the way back. So Eric, my question is, I have a child and three girls The sidewalk in front of our house is never passable. Like right now, if you were to drive down Old Stage Road, where the bus drops my daughter off up on Williston Road in Old Stage, she has to walk two blocks to our house. It's, she has to walk in the street. So I, I don't think it's ever even, we say we don't plow down so that we, because we just don't have obviously enough money or time to do that. So it's never, it's never ADA accessible. So. Thank you for sharing that. I know Lisa's making some notes on, on that. Yeah, um, just so everybody also knows, we do not apply salt to the sidewalks. Um, and there's multiple reasons that we don't do that. First, we're trying to do salt reduction in the town of Williston for number one. And number two, it extremely deteriorates and takes the concrete life expectancy and divides it in half from the salt. Yes. Chip and Kinger again, and I wasn't planning to speak to this, but in deference to the cameras, I'll speak to the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. I've watched some of the presentations of the requests at the select board meetings on Channel 17, and um, I wanted to comment on three three points. The first is that um, your numbers, your initial numbers, assume we've already per paid off the current plow, but you included amortizing the cost of the second plow. So that made the difference look bigger than it is in the long run. Um, the, um, um, I forgot the second one, but the third is that I'm a planning commission member and our town plan says we want walkable, pedestrian friendly streets and areas. And that we, that we want to reduce people, people taking cars when they could walk or bike, et cetera, et cetera. And so the goals of the town are in line with having more sidewalk plowing. And so, and oh, I know what the second one was. If you were to put up the numbers for what we spend on street plowing, they would dwarf those numbers for the sidewalk plowing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want to take this in context. We spend this amount on street plowing, and we spend this amount on sidewalk plowing. And the question is, do we add, do we, you know, do we significantly increase the sidewalk plowing? 
So I just want to say the town plan goals would say we should do more sidewalk plowing. Thanks. Other? Yes, right here. Right, so um, just for my hearing, is there any other options for vehicles in terms of plowing sidewalk? Oh, for, for a piece of equipment to use? Yes. I, I think our, our best bet is the sidewalk plow there. Um, I don't, Lisa, is there any other alternatives you've seen? They have other alternatives available, but that's the most cost efficient one for the town. And that's what most of the municipalities use. And then um, I have one more thing. It's in terms of using salt, um, is there any other option for sand maybe? <clears throat> And that, that also comes an issue with stormwater um, because the sand can get into the catch basins and then we'd have to sweep the sidewalks off, including the, uh, the roadways and twice a year. So that's one of the reasons we don't necessarily use sand on the sidewalks either. There has been occasions in which it was extremely icy. The temperature, I think it was four or five years ago. Um, in February, we had like 20 days that were negative 30 and <laughs> below. So we did put some sand down because there was just no chance that the ice was going to melt that year. Yes, in the green. If we were to ask homeowners to <clears throat> shovel in front of their own property, which I've lived in towns that have had that before, what happens with the pieces of property between houses that aren't necessarily homeowner owned? Who would be plowing those? That's a good question. I, I think it would, um, if the town were to take that approach as part of the uh, administrative yeah. piece, we would need to sort out because we would still need to maintain some walks in town, especially in front of municipal buildings, um, town properties. So then when you think about that, if you have these gaps between houses and you're going to send the plow up to plow them, then, you know, what's, what's, what's the point of having it go up and not plow because it's in front of houses? So right. those are details we the town would have to work out if it ever made a decision to, to move in that direction. Yes. I'm a little confused. Williston is such a spread out area. Where have you thought that this is going to be used, this plow? And have you uh, also uh, taken into consideration you're going to need another employee to do it? And uh, I would be interested to know if some of the uh, places like Middle Run, which has sidewalks, are they going to be uh, taken care of or is it just going to be here in this uh, immediate area of Williston? Let me, let me pull the map back up here, because that might help. So everything in orange, I know it's really hard to see with the, with the projection the way it is, but everything in orange, um, oh, there we go. Everything in orange, the town doesn't currently plow. So we, a lot of developments um, over here. Um, to, to answer your question about the employee, we have budgeted a part-time public works employee. The position currently isn't filled, but we've had that position budgeted and that position would operate the second piece of equipment. And how many times have you had to have uh, uh, that usage this winter? If you were looking at this winter, how much use would it have got other than that big storm? Um, how many times brought that if, if we had an additional sidewalk plow, um, we would be able to use two plows and get the work done faster as opposed to taking five plus more hours we would be able to do it in half that time with the two employees. And also, as Eric had mentioned earlier, if one of, if for some reason, <clears throat> excuse me, the existing plow breaks down, we have nothing. We have to wait till the parts come in and we can get it fixed and repaired, which that could be a week or two weeks. Meanwhile, none of the sidewalks are being plowed. He's asking, I think, how many storms have you had this winter where you have plowed the sidewalk? Quite a few, we've gone out quite a few times this year. I believe if we have two inches, we try to get out within 24 hours after the roads are all clear. Does that answer your question? Pretty much, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Next one back. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Uh, what, is, what has determined the, the streets you do do now? And secondly, uh, what specifically will be the method of resolving this, this issue? Sure, I, I think our method for how we've done the streets now, we've, the town has taken on, as you can see in the map, and this is the pink or fuchsia color, connections between places on, on our thoroughfares. And then additionally, under our town policy, 
residents and neighborhoods can request to have sidewalk segments added and the criteria for that is is reviewed is reviewed and i apologize i forgot the second um, part so of your question the, what's going to be the method to resolve this issue yes so the select board is taking feedback tonight um, we'll probably at the board's discretion take additional feedback in the coming year on this and if we were to add money in the budget for a second piece of equipment that would be put in during the fy22 budget process that would be but or or a future budget um depending on how what the board decides at that time and based on discussion so it's possible we could be coming back in a future year talking about a budget that may have a second piece of equipment in it so this is out of time okay. yes exactly all right over here um, that machine, I believe, is a multi-purpose machine. It can have different attachments. Is there anything you could use it for in different seasons to get more value from it, such as low side mowing or things like that? Um, we also have a stump grinder that attaches to it. So we use it during the summertime and fall for grinding stumps with it. That's the only other attachment other than the snowblower and the plow itself that we have at this time. Uh, a sweeper? I don't know. I don't think so. But. Over here. So I, I did hear you ask, I mean, say that people have come to the board requesting their areas be plowed. How often and are people asking to have their area plowed? I mean, is there that many people in addition to the areas that are, I mean, the areas that are not plowed, <clears throat> is there that many people that want to have their area plowed, the sidewalks? I didn't say that very well. Oh, no, no, I, I understand your question. Thank you for your question. The, the couple years I've, I've been here, we've had requests each of the last three Decembers. And uh, Rick, Lisa, historically, is it something we tend to get a couple every year? Is it kind of ebb and flow? It's... Is it the same place? Is it like, <laughs> gosh, why are you plowing this area? Because there's a lot of other places. Not always, no. <clears throat> yes. Um, my name is Carla Carstens, and I live in the Indian Ridge development. And um, the, we were one of the communities that came to the select board to ask for um, plowing for our neighborhood. Um, there's a number of school children that live in Indian Ridge that could potentially walk to school. There's, um, we're really close to the schools, um, so there was a request put in favor. It seemed to me, and, and maybe I'm interpreting, that there was a, a, a potential to say yes to our request, but it seemed that at this point in time, since there was no policy in place, it was kind of a hesitancy until <coughs> having this kind of a, an open discussion. So I really appreciate the fact that we're discussing it and getting it on board and trying to kind of um, come up with a policy so that it's a little bit more equal, like Lynn said. There's not like one community that says, oh yeah, we're going to plow this community and we're not going to plow this community and try to get a more consistent policy for the town. So thank you. Okay, is there anybody else who hasn't uh, right there in the middle? <coughs> Yeah, I'm interested to know whether uh, impact fees from development should be funding things like acquisition of additional equipment. It's a good question. I, I don't believe we've used <coughs> impact fees in the past. I'm looking to Rick for a, if he recalls. I, I don't think that's going to cost uh, equipment. Did you hear it said? Like not, not an eligible cost for, for new equipment under the impact fee uh, rules and, and statute. Okay, so we're going to draw this close here. Uh, yes. I just have one question to clarify the, the ADA part. Is the requirement that the sidewalks be clear to an ADA compliant uh, standard? Thank you. Or is it? for the people who can't go shovel their own sidewalks. I, I, there was a weird conversation that confused me. So is it, is it that the sidewalks need to be plowed to a certain depth and width, et cetera, et cetera, that's very hard to make homeowners, ask homeowners to do, or is it a matter of homeowners who can't go shovel because they have this ability to be cleared? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
answer it the best I can. I, I, I know from reading um, materials on this, and, and I'm not an expert in it, um, passable is, is what, it, what it calls for. But I'm, I'm not a, having sidewalks as passable. I know, but, but passable by what? Yeah, I'm. I'm afraid I can't speak to the specifics. there, just just with my my level of knowledge on that topic. Yes. Um, I think going off of that question, if if town sidewalks are supposed to be passable for all of the the, the sidewalks that are orange, how are we ensuring that they're passable now? If we're not plow if the town's not plowing that, how are we ensuring that those road those sidewalks are passable currently? I'll, I'll turn to Ted. I think, I think um, I'm no ADA expert in the slightest, but I, this is my understanding. Um, my understanding is that the, the Americans with Disabilities Act places no requirement on the town to plow anything, period. Um, the, I think the, the issue is if, if the town passes an ordinance mandating that if you live next to a sidewalk, you have to get it cleared, then if you are that person and you are disabled, the town has an obligation to take care of your part of that sidewalk for you and make it passable. But short of that, there is no requirement that the ADA, that from the ADA that the town do anything. The town doesn't have to plow any of the sidewalks. And we could save you know, that much more money in our property tax if we didn't. Um, the, if, if just continue on for a split second. The reason, the reason I, I wanted to hear from people tonight is because when you're on the select board, you get an issue and people come before you and then you wonder, okay, what does everybody else in town think? Because I've got you know, people who are here, but what does everybody else think? Um, the, the sidewalk issue is gonna continue on. It's not the biggest issue that the town faces, it, it, although it can be a critical issue if you are have a disabled child and you're trying to transport that child, or for that matter, if you have a child that's not disabled and you're trying to get them to Allen Brook School and they have to walk in the road. Um, the, uh, so I'm not saying it's not important, I'm just saying it's, in the scheme of things, it's not critical. The, at most, the, the issue that I, I'm curious about, though, is that um, you know, there, there are people in town who do not live next to a sidewalk and never use them. There are people in town who live in the village and say, that's great, but if I want to go to the grocery store, I'm not going to walk from the steeple church to Shaw's or Hannah. I'm going to take my car, so I'm not going to use the sidewalk for that. But the town continues to evolve, and we have places like Finney Crossing coming online, um, and those will be town roads at some point. Uh, they'll be town sidewalks. Um, we also have this, the, the sidewalks near Allenbrook that uh, Carlo was talking about. Um, and so the, the question that I was curious about is what, is, what is the philosophy versus what is the cost of, of, the, of the project? And again, I don't think this is anything that's going to be resolved tonight, but I, I just wanted to hear from people because on one hand, it, it makes perfect sense that we'd say, hey, what we're doing is enough. On the other hand, with the town evolving and more and more uh, uh, town planning saying we should be more pedestrian friendly, um, do we want to spend our money doing that? And so that's, that was the whole purpose of the, of the question. And the, answer to that. the other part of that was because we've gotten questions each year from one or two neighborhoods, it became a let's hear what everyone would like to do. Typically those questions come in after we've gotten a lot of our budget set. And so to make the change to say, yes, we'll do your neighborhood, all of a sudden affects what we've done for everyone. And that was why this year with Indian Ridge, which was a great request, I struggled because I'm going, I'm not being representative to the rest of the town. So that's another reason for putting this out here to see what people think. So, is there anybody who hasn't? Uh, Jim. Well, it, it, largely in response to the select board's question, we'd like to hear opinions. And we've heard mostly questions tonight and not necessarily asserted opinions. So when I was on planning commission, um, before we even had a DRB, um, we had a lot of reluctance to even build sidewalks. And our select board then said, 
this is Vermont, you can't use them in the winter. And that was really what was carrying the day. We also had probably 20 dairy farms in, in, in Williston. <clears throat> what does that have to do with anything? Well, what it really has to do with a lot of what you see on this map were, um, did occupy, was occupied by cows and not houses and, and people and roads and sidewalks. We also now have a better understanding that moving is important to people. Our sedentary lifestyles are, um, yes, literally killing us. We also have an understanding that um, our climate is headed for a train wreck and it's carbon um, largely in Vermont from motor vehicles and our homes. But in this case, the homes have sprouted the need for sidewalks and we still spend way too much time in our cars. So then I'm gonna wrap this one up by saying we have a pretty good sidewalk network um, which needs more expansion. We've gotten away from the 80s like we don't need them because you can't do it in Vermont in the winter. Um, we've gotten away from that. Now we need to understand that we've got the sidewalks and they do need to be plowed. And they need to be plowed on a regular basis. I think I heard every two inches of snowfall. Um, and we need to budget to do that. Um, our citizens shouldn't have to come and ask for their own little neighborhood piece to get plowed and, and um, hat in hand in front of the select board to get this done. This should be a town priority and um, Eric has, I think, indicated that he's working on and, and Rick has as well and so has the select board, a plan to acquire the necessary equipment, acquire the necessary um, workers to operate that equipment and to get the job done. And the job should be all the sidewalks that we have in town, not just the chosen few. And the chosen few have had some real rationale why they're done. But we do need to have the rest of them done. And so that's, that's one opinion piece. <laughs> and I thank you very much for, for that opportunity. that we don't do right now. We don't do it well. We can't walk on it. My daughter, could, you could drive by it right now and you can't walk down. It's, it's part of the bike path and it's on the sidewalk on a very busy road. Um, I, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that we would buy more equipment for something that we can't actually do with the equipment we have now. So uh, this is a uh, moderator. I typically don't make comments, but what I'm hearing you say is that the, it's not, you raise the issue that it's a question of whether it's being done in a way that's adequate. Right. At it's not adequate for walking right it, now. So if we add another piece of equipment to okay. do more, we're just going to add another piece of equipment to do more, but we're still not going to have walkable sidewalks. Okay. Others? We, I'm going to wrap this up short. Yes. Um, just to my opinion, I live in Hardin Woods, um, so we're, we're attached to Indian Ridge. Um, and I know that I would be willing to pay eight to ten dollars a year if it meant that our neighborhood got our sidewalks about. Um, and I think that many of my immediate neighbors would also. Um, so just putting that in out there. Ken? Just easier. Uh, so, opinion. We have spent millions of dollars in Williston to put in sidewalks. I think we had a 2.2, 2.8 million dollar bond several years ago. When new developments come in, they add sidewalks, bike paths, and so forth. It pains me to watch people walking in the gutter during a snowstorm. And I feel as though however we whittle it down through how they're maintained, how well they're maintained, et cetera, the reality is if we've made the investment in having these sidewalks installed, we should make the investment in making sure these sidewalks can be used year round and not treat them like a three-season porch. Thank you.
I, I will ignore the fact you're suggesting Vermont has four seasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a friend who walks to school every day. He lives like a little bit west of over there. Um, but anyway, I just seen him walk in more than once after he had like snowstorms or whatever storm he had. Soaking wet, he's fallen down and tripped or like accidentally fallen or something. Because of the snow, and I've had a little bit of a pair of snow pants more than once, so he's not like making every single seat in the classroom soaking wet. Okay, thank you. If there's a different viewpoint or something that hasn't been expressed, I will invite that. Otherwise, are you ready to move on? Actually, uh, how do you share further opinions if let's be able to, uh, in the future, I mean, to the select board directly, or what, what's the recommendation there? Is the website a way to, uh, is there a I would say you can contact the manager's office, um, email, phone call, stop by, and we'll, we'll gather the additional comments and, and share those with the board as, as they come in throughout the year. And public the board, works, the board, leave your card here, people have important questions. Yes. I know we're not supposed to do an official vote, but can we just show hands how many people are in favor of purchasing more equipment versus not? Or is that not allowed? It's not an official vote. It's just an opinion of everybody. So, so here, here's the problem <laughs> for me, because I'm not a big rules guy. So, <laughs> you're putting temptation in front of me. It's very hard. Uh, the, the reason why it's, it's announced this way is that people, uh, if they expect to vote, more people will show up, and so the people who aren't here aren't represented. I personally am not uncomfortable with a show of hands of, uh, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll just ask for a show of hands of peop think people, for people who think that something more should be done without defining that. Is that an appropriate way to phrase the question? Does that give you the answer that you're looking for? opinions? Well, it's representative of this group. Right. Just this group. So, so all those who would like to see something more done, raise their hand. And then all those who think that what we're doing is good enough or status quo, raise their hand. Okay. Uh, there's another group that wants more information before they raise their hands? Okay. So you know who to ask, right? Okay, so with that, I'll draw this conversation to a close. If I can find my magic sheet here. So then uh, Article 5, to transact any other business proper to be brought before said meeting. Is there any other business to be brought before the meeting? Yes, in the back. isn't being plowed, could we just make a note somewhere that that gets done in the interest of that child? Notes are being made. Anything else? Thank you. Anything else? Yes, Jacob. Yes, okay. I just wanted to correct something in the town reports. Um, the Planning Commission did have some turnover this year and I noticed a misprint. I hadn't read this until tonight. On page 66, the next to last paragraph said, we said so long this year to our long-serving chair. That should say vice chair, uh, Kevin Badson. Um, and in the next year's report, we'll probably um, recognize the departing of our long-serving chair, Jake Mathon. And Jake is here, and I, I just want to acknowledge him because he's been the backbone of the Planning Commission for a long time and the chair for Eight years of <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Bill White. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I'm going to Rick McGuire. I think he's done an outstanding job for the town. I'm an old resident, and I've seen him do his wonder for many, many years, and I think we're grateful we had him, and I wish him not so long. I hope you uh, enjoy the time.
I would remind you that the polls will be open from 7 to 7 tomorrow at the National Guard Armory to vote on Articles 6 through 17, which I will not read. Uh, but you have them on the warning. Um, seeing no further business, do I have a motion to adjourn to the, uh, is there a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it, we stand adjourned. Thank you for coming. Okay, I'd like to get started on the budget presentation. And for those that have stayed, thank you. I also want to thank you for the recognition. Um, I know Deb Beckett earlier talked about what a wonderful town this is, and it is. Um, recently, I, uh, the select board have hired a recruiting firm to help find a replacement, and um, they wanted to talk to me, and they asked me a few questions, and I went on and on about what a wonderful community, what a wonderful select board, what a wonderful staff we have, uh, and the, at the end, the guy asked, well, why am I leaving? <laughs> so, um, but it is a great community. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about budget. Uh, and as it happens, the budget is really um, more than just numbers. Um, the budget is a, uh, a plan, a plan that includes the services that we're going to be providing the cost of those services and how we're gonna pay for those services. We actually provide a wide range of services. In fact, I counted them and there are over 100 different services. The ones on the screen here are the ones that most people are familiar with. It includes police protection, fire suppression, road maintenance, library services, uh, recreation programs, et cetera. And we do our best to always strive to provide the most efficient services that we can. Uh, sometimes we're not quite as successful as we'd like to be, especially when it comes to snow plowing. So it's time to talk about the budget numbers. Now, I have a confession to make. I like talking about budgets. <laughs> Now, sometimes I'm actually surprised when I find that not everyone shares my excitement about budgets. Um, you know, some people actually like budgets to read and even find it relaxing. Now, Homer Simpson is not one of those people, as you can see from that picture there. But um, I'm gonna ask you to relax as we talk about the budget numbers. So. The proposed budget for next fiscal year is 11.7 million. It represents an increase over the current budget of about 176,000, which represents a 1.5% increase over the current year. A good part of the um, increase amounts is, is caused by an increase in wages and benefits. Um, and there's several reasons for this. First, uh, we base most wage increases on the cost of living index, and that's around 2%. We also have um, experienced some huge increases in the cost of health insurance. We're not obviously in the only organization that has experienced this, but certainly it's had a major impact on our costs. We're also adding um, a full-time position in the recreation department. This is a recreation program coordinator. Currently, that position is a part-time position. We're going to be making it a full-time position. We're also creating a new part-time position in the library, uh, and that uh, both positions are really uh, a reaction to the increasing levels or the um, demands for service, which is a direct result of the increasing population in Williston. Capital projects and debt service are down by about 143,000. And I snuck a picture of my granddaughter in there. <laughs> uh, she is um, enjoying a sit in the, one of our fire trucks. So things go better with pie, and so I uh, took the numbers and put it into a pie chart here. It's important to note that um, 
the cost of services, according to this pie chart, the biggest part of that pie is actually for public safety related services. Includes town roads, fire service, police and ambulance services. Combined, it represents about 55% of the total. So that is mostly where your tax dollars are going. Now, how we pay for that, there's a variety of different ways. Um, we have uh, user fees, we have local option tax, we have host town fees, um, and property taxes, of course. And translating that into a pie chart, uh, the largest piece of that pie, not surprisingly, are the property tax, which represents about 49% of the total. Um, local option taxes are also a significant portion, representing 27% of the total. Um, that uh, lately has been a great resource for us. Uh, with the downturn in the economy, that we expect to see a significant decrease in that um, because it's a very volatile tax source. So the answer to the question about what's it going to cost me, um, the municipal tax rate each year is set in June by the select board typically. And that's following the grand list, which is set in April um, for the next fiscal year. And I'm talking about the municipal tax rate here. Uh, based on the current budget, we're expecting about a half cent increase. This means that you, um, people who have um, property in town will pay about $8 more per year per $100,000 in value. Now, I wanted to show this chart because it shows the property taxes over a five-year period. And if you take the five-year period, the total five-year period, and take the total increase over that five-year period, including the increase projected for next year, the, the amount is $14 per $100,000 in value over that five-year period. And I have some more good news on that, if you can talk about taxes being good news. Um, this is a comparison of municipal tax rates around Chittenden County. Um, I'm sure it's not easy to see the names of the communities, but Williston is at the bottom, or near the bottom, I should say. It's next to the bottom. Uh, the only town lower, um, has lower municipal tax rate than Williston, is the town of Charlotte. And they offer quite a different level of service than is offered in Williston. And so as I talked um, about budgets, I also wanted to emphasize the fact that the budget is about services. The town provides, as I said before, an extensive array of services, and occasionally people even thank us for that service. Um, this is a letter that our police department received from, believe it or not, a protester in town. Um, this happened, I think it was last summer, during one of the protests. And I'm just gonna read it because it may be hard to read. It's, so it says, Dear Chief Foley, my heartfelt thanks to you and your department for your respectful presence at the Never Again protest yesterday. If your officers felt a challenging juxtaposition during the march, it was not apparent in their demeanor. Please share my gratitude. We, and of course, this is just one of many, many thank you notes that we received. And in other news, two feet of snow fell this morning. <laughs> Um, I actually, uh, I've used this graphic in previous years, and um, Gary Howard, who is often here, uh, had asked to see it again, but he's not here tonight, so <laughs> I'll have to tell him when I see him that I actually used it again. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have on the town's budget. I'm gonna give, um, right after this, um, a little talk about the bond vote, and then we'll have Eric Wells talk a little bit about some of the charter changes. But right now, I'll entertain questions about the town's budget. Yes, sir. You uh, mentioned that the taxes were gonna be going up for property taxes. Municipal taxes, yes. And I'm wondering, what with this new city here in Williston that's moved into our Taft Corners area, is that going to hurt us with all these new houses and all those large buildings that are four-story, or is that going to be a real help in the tax situation? Well, there's no easy answer to that. I can tell you, quite a few years ago, when Act 60 first came into play, and I don't know if you're familiar with Act 60, but long-term residents certainly are. Um, we were very concerned about that because it was shifting taxes out of Williston to the state 
And um, for example, a lot of the commercial development, um, according to the study, was not paying for itself because that tax money wasn't coming to the town, it was going out of town. However, because the local option tax, I think that does change the equation. On the, municipal, or on the residential side, I would say that the homes do pay for the services. Um, in other words, they, the, the value of their homes do cover the cost of municipal services. And um, it, all the commercial um, activity generates a lot of calls for public safety, um, police, fire, ambulance. Um, and as I said, with the advent of the local option tax, I can say that they are now paying for themselves as well. But that initial study showed that they weren't. But things have changed. Well, don't they have a property tax just like uh, the individual owners have in the town? They do. But because the municipal tax rate is so low, they aren't covering their services. The, and it used to be that they paid for themselves in a different way because the money would come to town to pay for education. But as I said, that money goes out of town now to the state. I don't understand. If I pay, let's say, $2,000 a year for property taxes, I drove through that area last night. I was amazed. There must be four to 5,000 people that are living in that one area. And I live right across the street. And I have been there since 70. And you mean to tell me we can't get a lot of money out of all those homes and everything to help our tax break? Well, we are, yes, absolutely. Any increase in the grand list does um, help uh, keep the tax rate low in, in Wilson, absolutely. And we still have to go up in taxes this year. That is projecting. It's just about a half cent, yes. Any other questions? Is, is there a broader vision about walkable, bikeable for Wilson? how you're hooking up with Burlington, that kind of thing. Because I, I find it one of the more persuasive arguments to say, we kind of have a vision as a town where we actually get things built and that greater density is actually the right thing environmentally. I like that about Williston. There's other places that don't want to develop, and I think it distinguishes us. So I'd like to support that kind of movement by the town. Well, it is supported in the town comprehensive plan of development, and, and th that plan has been in place for longer than I've been here. Um, and it, many years ago, um, I, I remember constant complaints from outside of Williston about how Williston was an example of sprawl. What they didn't understand is that the town did have a clear plan in mind, and that was to concentrate development, which is exactly what is happening now. And concentrated development makes develop, or the delivery of town services much more efficient, which is, I think, what your point is. And the connectivity is certainly part of it, and, and we'll be, uh, I'm sure there'll be growing discussions, not just about sidewalk connectivity, but also roadways. Um, and in fact, the next topic I'm going to talk about, there's a connectivity issue as part of that too, but um, I'll get that into that in a minute. But anyway, I, I think I'm agreeing with your point. Yes, yes. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm on the drill the wrong topic, but um, so I'm wondering where do most of Wilson's people's taxes go? Well, that I can go back a couple slides. So that's the expense chart. So in reality, most of the tax dollars that people that own property in town goes to the schools. A small portion of that goes to municipal government. And municipal government, our services are represented by that pie chart. And as I said, maintenance of the roads, police service, fire service, I call, call public safety because their job is to make the roads safe for the public, to make sure um, the uh, protection from police and fire and all that. And that represents the largest piece of that pie, is for those kinds of services. All the other services um, are much smaller slivers of that pie. And so that's where, when you, when you say municipal tax dollars, that's where your, your money is going. Did I answer your question? Good. Yes. Uh, climate change is an existential threat to this community. I don't see it on representing that pie chart. How are we addressing climate change in our 
equal budget? That is, as you know, a work in progress. Um, the, your committee has been working on preparing a recommendation to the Planning Commission, which will be then going to the Select Board. Um, and so th at that point, um, it will become uh, a topic of greater discussion. And if there are elements that require our cost expenditures, those will have to go through the same process as any other expense. But in a way, we're seeing some of that perhaps through some of these major storm events that we've had. And again, I'm going to about to talk about um, a bond vote that involves uh, partly a, a damage that was caused by a major storm event. Other questions? If not, I'm going to jump right into the next article. Okay, this is the Muddy Brook Culvert. This is, um, I believe, Article 7. You'll be asked to vote on this tomorrow in addition to the budget. Now, in April 2017, um, the damage was done to this culvert. And we're not quite sure what storm event caused it, but um, there was some erosion of the soils around the top of the culvert and around the bottoms and sides. And a, what we thought was a little pothole turned out to be much greater than a little pothole. There was a huge um, cavernous opening underneath the pavement surface. And that caused us to close the road immediately to traffic. And we were able to work with the city of South Burlington, which border, both towns border um, this uh, Muddy Brook, which uses this culvert. And um, we got a temporary bridge put in um, with the help of the state of Vermont. And this temporary bridge was installed um, by the end of April 2017. After the bridge was installed, the town worked with South Burlington to uh, hire a firm to do design work. And a preliminary design was submitted to the select board and the city um, of South Burlington's town council um, in October of 2018. Um, after looking at this preliminary design, the select board and the city council in South Burlington approved the preferred alternative. Then in October of 2019, that culvert you can see is being washed down the stream. Now, in addition to that, uh, that wouldn't be so bad perhaps because, well, the culvert's gonna have to be removed anyway after all, but the storm did significant damage to the supports to the temporary bridge that had been put over this culvert, forcing us to again close the road to traffic. Fortunately, with the help of the state of Vermont again and some federal funds, a um, temporary repairs were made and the bridge reopened in December of 2019. The design work on the permanent replacement is about 90% complete as I understand it. Uh, the permitting process um, still needs to get uh, underway. And if it is approved by both the city of South Burlington and the town of Wilston on the vote tomorrow, um, the work could begin as soon as this fall of 2020. And it's about a nine month process to complete the job. So we expect if it starts in the fall, it could be completed by the spring of 2021. So as I said before, um, the select board had approved a preferred alternative. This preferred alternative is a um, significant improvement over the current um, layout of the road. Um, it allows for pedestrian access across that road by providing a separate pathway. And I, by separate, I mean there's separation between the roadway and this pedestrian crosswalk. Um, so that is a significant improvement, and this is part of the plan that was approved by the select board. The cost for this work is 1.8 million, and that will be split 50-50. Uh, so the town of Wilson's cost is 500,000, or one, I'm sorry, $900,000. The plan is to pro, uh, finance that project over a 20-year period, and we're estimating the cost impact to citizens will be about $3 annually per $100,000 value. And with that, I'll answer questions you might have on this particular project. Yes, ma'am. So will the road be closed again during the construction? The question is, will the road be closed during construction? And the answer is yes. So if we start in the, the fall of 2020, this coming fall, then it'll be closed until it's completed in uh, the spring. 
And as you probably know, that's a major problem because the traffic caused by people finding alternate ways is a huge problem. Right? So bumper to bumper from Kennedy Drive all the way to uh, Route 2A. Yeah. What have things learned this past, when we had two months of uh, this kind of traffic this past year, were people taking notes of maybe we should put a traffic lane where we drive in Route 2, maybe we should Well, I, I, th we're going to have to have some conversation with South Burlington on this because there there are some things that um, perhaps can be done to ease the traffic concerns a little bit. It's not going to be 100 percent, but there are things that can be done. That's a much longer period of time. Yes. And, I mean, it did seem that there must have been some adjustments to traffic lights because it did improve after about a month. But I don't know if it's because people decided you know they were going to go other way. Yeah, I think that's a large part of it. People adjusted um, their schedules. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a concern that we're going to have to try to do something about. Any other questions? All right. If, oh, yes. Sir. Um, I was just wondering uh, if you would allow, you should uh, be able to see a show of hands of who um, uses the route that I forget who's talking about. But well, the, the gentleman was asking if he, he wants to see a show of hands of people who use that section of road, I, and I think most of us do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay, <clears throat> then we're going to move on to some of the um, uh, articles, uh, what is it, 8, 9, 10, I think it is. And Eric Wells, the system manager, will be addressing those. All right, so I'll run through the, our three charter change article proposals here. I'll start with Article 8. Um, this applies the practice of self-governance to allow the town to make some decisions related to its charter without approval at the state level. Uh, it's a question of local versus state control. So I'll back up and talk about charters in general here. A charter is a document that defines an or the organization, its powers, functions, and essential procedures of a municipal government. So I'll take a, a brief moment for a uh, name this 19th century justice here. Um, anyone name this former Iowa Supreme Court justice who has impacted Vermont law? <laughs> All right, I've stumped you. <laughs> this is a uh, former justice John Dillon, whose namesake is Dillon's Rule. So. Vermont is a Dillon's Rule state, one of a handful of states left in the country that follows Dillon's Rule, meaning municipalities are creatures of the state of Vermont, and as such, must have permission from the state to define governing terms in a charter. John Dillon, the Iowa Supreme Court Justice, is a namesake of this rule. It stems from his 1868 decision that determined the bounds of a local government's legal authority. He wrote, municipal corporations owe their origin to and derive their powers and rights wholly from the legislature. As it creates, so may it destroy. If it may destroy, it may abridge your control. So this decision continues to drive the relationship between municipalities in many states today. Charters enable municipalities to deviate from general statute in specific instances. Currently, 57 Vermont cities and towns have charters, and 24 villages have them as well. In the process to change a charter, currently, it's approved by a Vermont municipality that has to then be approved by the legislature to become law. As such, the legislature can modify or strike charter changes that were approved first at the local level. On the flip side of that, since the charter is state law, the legislature does have the authority to change municipal charter without the people of, of the municipality first approving that change. And I'll, I forgot, here's the article on, on the screen. So this proposal in section two, um, article eight on, on the ballot, would allow any charter provision approved for any other municipality to be adopted by a majority of Wilson voters as a provision in the town's charter without that need to obtain approval from the legislature first. So our thinking behind this is if one municipality in Vermont is able to do something under charter, then any other municipality should be granted the same authority if it is the will of the people. So that's what this question is asking you. Um, and any questions there? 
All right, thanks for bearing with my, my charter history overview here. <laughs> so I'll go on to Article 9. Oh, sorry, I'll, all right, I'll Sure. <laughs> Can you go back to Sure. So does that work under Dylan's rule? In other words, if the citizens of Williston say if the legislature approves a charter change for any other municipality, we want to have the ability to do that. Do we get it? So that's a good question. So at, at that point, the legislature would then need to approve that charter change, and it would start in the House, um, the Government Operations Committee. So this brings the discussion to them. Okay, and so the town of is holding Dylan's rule. Exactly. <laughs> So this uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns has driven this conversation, this biennium. Um, there's been a bill in the Senate for a pilot um, committee for some self-governance work. Um, it's currently in, in the House. Uh, the House hasn't taken that up yet. But other municipalities are talking about these issues. So this is a way of us looking at, at that issue locally and kind of raising this point of if another municipality is able to do something by charter, why shouldn't Williston be able to do that if it's the will of the people? So if we vote yes, that is advisory to the legislature. Yeah, essentially they would have to approve that change, so then they'd have to look and say, well, that goes a bit against Dylan's rule, but it, it broadens that conversation and gets it, gets it some attention, I'd say. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, other question? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm assuming that there's, a, that there's an issue that prompted this we, we didn't have a, a particular issue, and I'm looking if there was anything here, but it, it's more of that conversation. We've, uh, managers in the state have, have been looking at this and, and discussing with VLCT for, for over a year, and, and we brought this to the, the board, this issue, and I'll turn it to Rick as well. <laughs> so what, what kind of things would it be referring to? Would it be about? Well, it can cover a wide range of issues. This is an issue, actually, that I feel really strongly about because the state increasingly has, and the state legislature has been increasingly taking more and more authority away from municipalities and making decisions for us. Um, and it, it's getting more, really frustrating across the state. And I think this, the state actually is losing out partly because they aren't allowing towns to make decisions for themselves. They're not allowing for some maybe experimentation on different things that if it works out, then maybe other towns should be looking at it. The state has been very paternalistic in the way they're treating municipalities, which I find somewhat surprising since a lot of people that serve in the legislature at one point were on select boards in other communities. And so I just, Increasingly over the years, I've been I've been becoming increasingly frustrated with the the level of control the state exerts. And frankly, there are many municipalities that really are what's the word I want to look up are nervous about what we're proposing only because they're afraid the state may go the other way and take stuff away from the um, communities that have charter provisions. And the state may say, well, wait a minute, we don't want this community to have it, and then other communities will want it, and so we're gonna take it away from the community that already has it. And so uh, and there's a lot of that kind of thing going on. So I I'm just feel a little more strongly about it than what Eric stated. So, so for example, what are some ways that the, that the state has imposed its will over the municipality? Well, a good example is Article 10. We um, have a um, union contract with both the police and fire unions. And um, we have a, a specific method that we negotiated to resolve disputes. And for disputes that involve grievances, we go through a process. And if we can't reach an agreement, we go through something called binding arbitration. For contracts themselves, we don't have that provision. We specifically did not negotiate that because we thought it would put the town at a disadvantage. Well, the state went ahead and imposed it upon us last legislative session. They voted that for public safety unions, police and fire, 
binding arbitration is required as a contract dispute mechanism. We don't have a choice. So we lost out on the ability to negotiate that, and someone other than townspeople are get voting on the union contract if we reach an impasse. The good news is we've never reached an impasse uh, where we got to that point, but it really is taking the decision totally out of our hands. And so that, that's Article 10, um, which we're going to talk about shortly, but um, that's an example of the type of thing that the state's been doing. All right, I'll just jump back to nine here um, quickly. So Article 9 is a proposal in Section 16 to provide the town manager with the ability to hire or remove the library director with the advice and consent from the library board of trustees through a majority vote. So this is really going to, looking to formalize a practice that has occurred when the library directors have been hired twice over the past 20 years. Um, it's protecting the status quo for this process. Um, the select board and the library board of trustees are supportive of this process and, and this language in the charter uh, proposal for, for change. So this came about when we hired uh, Jane, who you met this evening last uh, fall. Um, we realized that the charter was silent on the ultimate hiring authority. And since we were working on other charter amendments, it was a good time to include this language to make the process clear. Um, the manager's office and the trustees have worked well historically on this, and this charter change formalizes process. Um, so there, it's there for the future, and it's something we can, we can look to when a library director needs to be, be hired down the road. Any questions on Article 9? Uh, yes, in the back. I have questions about the previous article. Sure. So I just, if we have the manpower and uh, we, we have, the DRB is a volunteer board, and so environmental questions come up with issues and, and traffic and things like that. So do we have, um, this is, we can always fall back on the state, I guess, In, in terms of staffing for uh, addressing um, issues that might come up that we want to take on ourselves at the local level, uh, do we have the manpower uh, the, the staff to look into um, issues that might arise by something that we want to pass or something that we have concern about and want to uh, navigate that local level? I know we have a very, very active and busy planning department, and I know as, as issues like that come up, if it's something we need to just take a broader look at, we have, we have other recess, resources to call upon if it was a, a legal question to check with counsel, and it would really depend on the circumstance, I guess, to, to, to address it. Do you don't mind if I jump uh -huh. in here, do you? Um, the, uh, the, there's so, uh, such a wide range of possible changes to the charter, it, it's hard to know to really answer your question properly, because many th times it doesn't involve any changes at all in terms of staff requirements. I think the important part is that any time the town's considering doing something like that, if this were to be approved, it would take a town-wide vote by Australian ballot. And I would presume that the town would have to go through a process of identifying any potential advantages and costs associated with that kind of change. Question. Rick, sure. just kind of revert back to the hypothetical situation you brought up about we haven't really ever had a situation arise where we've had an impasse, we've been able to solve the issues. But are you basically saying that the state could technically step in, approve a budget, that they would have to pay for, it, but the local townspeople would have to buy by it if they like approved some increase in salaries or whatever we're you know, at an impasse as far as contracts with the unions? Yes. Um, yes, if we reached an impasse with one of the unions yeah. and the uh, arbitrator, it went to arbitration, the arbitrator made a decision, let's say to increase it whatever percentage and whatever it is, let's say 5%, and we were saying the most we could afford is 3%, the 5% would roll and we would not have a choice. 
and that's an independent arbitrator. And that's Article 10, which we're getting to next. <laughs> Yeah, as re I'll just quickly Article 10 just to, to make sure we, we've outlined it here. This, this change in state law requires the arbitration to take place. If there's an impasse in a public safety collectively bargain contract, that exists for 20 days after the release of a fact finder's report. Um, so the charter change that we're proposing, it would be a new section of the charter which defines the process for us to fall locally. And if approved by the voters and approved by the legislature, this charter change would then um, replace what's in state statute as our own process to resolve a, an, um, a contract dis dispute that has reached an impasse at that, at that juncture. But technically, that's correct. That it would follow really follow Dylan's rule, and it would need to be approved by the legislature for us to deviate from what was in yeah. state law last year. So, so yeah. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions on charter changes? All right, thank you. And that's it. That. <laughs> that concludes our meeting. Thank you all for coming. I, I made the same mistake that Tony made. The school would like to do a brief presentation on their budget, right? The floor is yours. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I, I'll just. Good evening. Thank you all for staying. I know it's getting late. Um, my name is Jocelyn Adams, and and I'm Angela Arsenault. We are two of the four Williston reps for the Champlain Valley School District, um, and we were hoping to go quickly through slides that outline um, not only our budget, but a few bonds that will be on tomorrow's ballot. Um, so our agenda is we will have a quick introduction. We have some points of pride um, for the Williston schools and CVU, um, enrollment projections for next year, what our proposed budget for the year of 2020, 2021, including our budget goals, the budget factors, and our tax implications. Um, and then there are there's the stewardship bond articles, and then we'll leave it open for questions. Um, so our mission um, is to learn, think, live, contribute, and pure, pursue excellence. Um, all of our schools um, revolve around this mission, and you'll see that our budget goals um, go into this as well. So we are a consolidated school district, and our school district, although we will be focusing mostly on Williston, um, the larger budget does encompass Charlotte Central School, Hinesburg Community School, uh, Williston Central School, Allenbrook, well, Williston Schools, which is Williston Central School and Allenbrook, Shelburne, um, CVU, and then St. George comes into Williston. Um, and 
not surprising, the Wilson schools have the largest student population and we are right around 992. And we also have the largest staff of about 213 for the elementary, elementary and middle schools. So points of pride for Williston schools. Um, we have a focus on nurturing strong, trusting relationships with students and families. ABS and WCS are PBIS exemplar blue ribbon schools for multiple years running. Teachers who continue to contribute to their field recognized for excellence on the state and national level, including an impressive list of national board certified teachers. We have a thriving CY mentor program that has about 60 middle school students that are involved. Um, just a little plug, if you are looking to maybe get involved as a mentor, um, Nancy Carlson is always looking for um, committed mentors for next year. Um, there is an active school safety team with close working partnerships with local agency responders. Um, we have a system-wide emphasis on community service and helping those um, through the eighth grade challenge projects, disaster relief, and various fundraisers. We have a vibrant co-curricular programming featuring high participation rates, athletics, and drama programs, and we inspire curiosity and enthusiasm for learning through a variety of experiences in the essential arts, including design and technology and family and consumer science. Um, I also wanted to add that um, our first and second graders at Allenbrook were in involved with the Kids Heart Challenge and they raised over $11,000 for the American Heart Association. Points of pride for CVU, our Latin teacher, Leanne Morton, was awarded UVM's Outstanding Teacher of the Year. Cole Glover, who is a CVU student, was selected as a muralist for the Burlington Community Arts Mural Program. 98% of our students graduate or complete school at the end of their senior year. Special Olympics bowling team came home with gold, bronze, and silver medals. CVU student Sabrina Brochu is serving on the State Board of Education. 61 students and faculty slept outside in solidarity for homeless and youth in our communities. They raised over $7,000 for Spectrum Youth and Family Services. Both cross-country teams won the state championships and the girls won New England's for the second year in a row. CVU's Racial Alliance Committee led the effort to raise the Black Lives Matter flag. Girls and boys soccer and boys and girls volleyball were Division I state champions. And the 315 students of CVU's class of 2019, of those students, um, were accepted into 238 higher level institutions around the world. Um, so assessment results for Williston. This is, it's kind of hard. I'm sorry that these graphics um, aren't the best for being so far away. Um, but essentially what they're showing is that Williston compared to Vermont um, is above the rest of the state, um, except I believe it's grade four math, um, which is just an area that we've known has been something that we're focusing on. Um, but overall, our students are testing higher than their peers um, in Vermont. For assessment results for CVU, um, for grade nine, um, language arts and grade nine math, CVU students are um, scoring higher than their peers in the rest of Vermont. So enrollment, this is something that's big across our state. Um, it's, a, it's a continuing concern for our state, um, but in Champlain Valley School District, although um, you will see that there was a slight decrease in student enrollment from the 2018, 2019 to 2019 to 2020, 2020 school year, which is this year, um, it was really tiny, 0.9%. Um, and for next year, our projections are to be pretty um, negligible. We think it's going to be about maybe a de decrease of six students. I do want to do a little asterisk there. We have a really difficult time um, projecting what our kindergarten enrollment and what our ninth grade enrollment will be. Um, we've been trying very hard to change that and we're doing a much better job. Um, we have someone from Allenbrook who actually goes to all of our community partners who are serving preschoolers trying to get a better um, number of the kindergarteners. So although it's showing 963 right now, that may not be what happens um, come the fall. Um, but our district feels very good about what our current um, enrollment is. We're 
we're pretty level. We don't ex expect to go down. Um, I know that all four reps from Williston are constantly asking uh, the town manager how we're not seeing a big increase in students with all of the building that we know is happening at Finney Crossing and across the town. Um, so enrollment trends for CVSD altogether is there's been, um, there's a projected of a negative 1.3% for next year. So that's across all of our schools, all of our um, elementary, middle school, and then CVU. Again, 1.3% is, is a fairly small number and it, it's not something that we're concerned about. And we also won't know until September what our actual enrollment will be. Um, so just like the town, budget work happens year round. Um, we mostly focus on it from November until tomorrow. Like that's when it looks like we're doing most of the work. Um, however, we're doing it all year round. So we normally have a school board retreat in May where we start making our budget goals and our goals for the year. Um, and then a lot of work happens at central office through the summer. Um, our special education budget actually has to be done before school even starts. So that portion of the budget is already complete um, just because of the state regulations surrounding that. Um, and the entire time that this is happening, district office is speaking to the school principals, getting feedback from teachers about what they need, what's working, what's not working. And then in November, the finance committee starts really deep delving on the um, numbers. We do several community outreach, um, trying to present what, where we're going with the budget, why, um, why the numbers are looking the way that they are. Um, and then we communicate it, which is happening right now. And, um, and then it gets voted on. Um, we just want to say thank you to all the parents, um, our community members, teachers, support staff, administrators for all the feedback we get. Um, there's specifically one meeting that the community's in, um, invited to at CVU where um, you can get more information about your specific town and we get feedback that way. There is a community survey that goes out that we've gotten um, and then staff and our administrators give us a lot of feedback as well. So our board budget goals. Um, when we start thinking about where we wanna be for next year, what we're keeping in mind is supporting an, the implementation of our mission, which was at the beginning, um, meeting or exceeding education quality standards. So those are the standards that have been put on us that we need to meet. Um, implementing key initiatives, implement and continue to improve the budget process, including the focus on com community input. Um, we are very grateful that you all are still here at um, 10 of 10, I mean 10 of 9. Um, community input is so, so important for us. Um, and all at a cost that we think the community will support. So we could, you know, shoot for the moon and the stars, but if the community is not going to support it, that, it, that budget doesn't work. Um, so right now, so one of um, the the education quality standards um, that we follow tells us that for kindergarten, we need to keep an average of students in a class. Um, the class size needs to be under 20. For K through three, it also has to be under 20, 20 or under, I should say. And for grades four through eighth, um, they need to be under 25. Right now, our averages for kindergarten are 18.3 with a range of between 17 and nine. Um, K through three is 18.5, with the range being 17.25 to 19.5. And um, for, for fourth through eighth grade, it would be 20.3 is the average, with 19.4 to 22 as the range. And I'm, I'm sorry, it's not current. This would be for next fiscal year. Um, we are meeting EQS this year, but um, this is what it would look like with the numbers that we have. Um, so district initiatives. We, um, the administration came to the school board and these were the things that they were asking for. And I do wanna back up just a little bit. There is gonna be a place for me to say this, but just as the town was commenting earlier, we um, are seeing a significant raise in health insurance costs. Um, that alone it is a 13.2% increase from last year. 
Um, and we also are seeing a huge, huge maybe isn't the correct wording, but for special ed spending, which this is money we need to spend. The, the federal government says that these are kiddos who need certain services and we need to spend that money. It's up 5.2%. Um, so I just want to preface that. But we, um, we are wanting to increase in early literacy supports for struggling learners. Um, and this is actually not any new positions. Um, so there is something called Act One funding, which funds early literacy funding so that we can have early literacy teachers in our schools. And it is all based off of students being qualified for free and reduced lunch. Um, because our district um, there are certain districts like Burlington, as an example, who they um, they have a large enough percentage of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch that their entire district receives it. That doesn't happen here. We don't ha we don't have a, we don't reach that threshold. So our schools are actually compared to one another. And if one of our schools has an increase in the free and reduced lunch, it can actually affect the other schools. So there was actually an uptick in Heinsburg, which meant that Shelburne, who has always who has received um, the Title I funding, no longer qualifies. Those students, there's still the need for that early uh, literacy support. It's just now not going to be funded by the federal government. And so um, Heinsburg actually gets more support that's paid for, um, but we can't, we can't in good conscience take away um, 1.5 um, FTE, so that's one, like essentially one and a half full-time teachers to do that work. Um, so we've added that into the budget. Um, investments in pre-K through eighth essential arts, equity, including science, technology, engineering, and math. One of the things that we have been looking to do since we consolidated is um, taking a really hard look at all of our schools and making sure that all the opportunities given to our students is equitable. And last year, one of the things the school board had asked our administration was, what's happening in, in essential arts with art, music, gym, um, and then like life sciences? And um, Williston is an example of one of the towns that our students weren't getting as much of that as other students. Um, and so we are gonna be adding 1.8 um, of a teacher, so that's like one whole teacher, 0.8 across the whole district to help um, even that out. For Williston, that means we're gonna be getting 0.8 um, more teacher, which is going to go over art and music. This is really great for a couple of reasons. First, we've been having staff who have been having to go between Allenbrook and Williston Central School. We're paying them to travel, and it's also inhibiting um, our schools from being able to do a better um, master schedule. I know at Allenbrook, um, it's been making it so that um, kids can only have morning, cla morning class at maybe art or music rather than um, having the flexibility of it going into the afternoon. It's really kept Williston Central School from doing some really creative things they want to do with their list, with their uh, math, the with their master schedule. Um, and so what will result out of this is that um, kindergarten will get an additional 40 minutes of music, um, which will make it two classes of 40 minutes weekly. The pre-K kiddos do not receive music education at all at this point, and um, it should allow them to get either 20 to 30 minutes a week. Um, and then in first and second grade, they will be getting um, an extra 40 minutes of art a week. Um, and this just really helps the schedule and also it um, will make us fall in line with Shelburne, Hinesburg, and Charlotte. Um, I believe it's Hinesburg and Charlotte will both be getting 0 0.5 um, because they were also behind Shelburne. Um, so yes, that is, so that'll utilize the staff time better um, and the master schedule which is very important. Um, and then right sizing of the CVU leadership and guidance staff to match increased enrollment. So the ask um, of the school board was to add a additional guidance counselor and then an additional administrative staff member. Um, I believe it was five or six years ago. Yes, ma'am? Uh, it was gonna be at the end, but if you'd like to. Oh, I'm sorry.
um, we were right sizing it to the level that we thought the, the students should be receiving. So um, I don't believe that Shelburne, so Shelburne was getting the most essential arts, um, but after discussing with the different schools, I think that it was, it's not I think, I know that it was decided that that was the right level, and so we were bringing, we're trying to bring Hinesburg, Charlotte, and Williston up to that level. And it won't mean exactly the same. It would mean that they would be at a one teacher, to, it's a one to, it will be between 61 and 65 ratio. So one teacher does 61 to 65 students, which I don't have the numbers from the current, um, but I think it's closer for Williston being a one to, um, I think it's just under 200 ratio. We were already meeting EQS, the yes. education quality standards for those areas. Actually, the place that we were not was guidance at CVU, which, which, I, I'm, which, is, one which is one of the things that I was going to, yeah. yes. Yes. Um, and one of the questions I can, I can tell you that the school board was asking last year was, um, so if one of the schools is getting more music, say, say they get a lot more music, are those kiddos, when they get to high school, are they, are they, you know, going after, are they the ones who are, um, pursuing music in band or or continuing on with that education versus the kiddos that don't. And um, it's just, it's one of the things that we've been trying to untangle. Um, but it was, we have been meeting EQS, but it's what um, our administration and what the school board believes is what the level that we want all of our students at. Um, so with regards to the right sizing of the CVU leadership and guidance, five or six years ago, um, like the rest of the state, we thought that um, enrollment was gonna be dramatically going down and continuing to go down. And at that time, it was decided that um, they could take away a guidance, to, uh, guidance counselor and take away one of the administrative staff. However, um, there was a little dip at CVU and then it, um, it went constant, it came back out. And what we've found is we have not been meeting EQS for guidance, um, meaning that we need another guidance counselor. And then for the administrative staff, um, there are, I believe it's four houses, um, and we only have three house directors, um, which has been really putting that a real strain. And um, Adam Bunting, the principal, um, he, this was a request, hopefully making it so that the administrative staff are not just constantly putting out fires, but are actually being able to be, um, to be preemptive, having relationships with students, being able to catch things before they happen. Um, and we thought that it made a lot of sense. Um, social emotional learning supports in all schools. Um, so there are things called like planning rooms or, um, Treehouse, and so these are programs that are social emotional supports for students who need extra support in the classroom. It's where they can go if they need a break. They have trained professionals who can help them re-regulate so that they can get back into the classroom. And um, we're currently doing an assessment of trying to figure out how to best strengthen those programs. And if it's determined that Williston needs it, then um, there is a .5 behavioral interventionist um, position that's being held for us if, if it's deemed that we need it, if it makes sense into the program. Um, and there are some positions that are going um, into the other schools as well. And um, the last one is additional middle school substance abuse personnel, which is grant funded. And we are, so that's an S SAP counselor. Um, so that is all Medicaid funding. That's not actually something you'll see affecting our budget, like with what the community needs to pay for. But currently we're at a half time position and we'll be going up to a 1.0 position. And so I know it seems very heavy on what we're adding for personnel, but um, we actually are having three, um, three full-time staff reductions, and it's all based on EQS. So this year, um, because of what we believed would be the projection for Williston's kindergarten class, we went from six kindergarten classes to seven. We actually also um, increased a first, second grade teacher as well. 
Um, the first second grade teacher we needed, definitely needed. This year, um, seeing what we're going from kindergarten to what's projected for next year, we actually don't need that seventh kindergarten teacher, so that's gonna be removed, and there are two other positions similar to that in the district that are, that are not needed purely because of EQS, so that's purely meeting um, how many students should be in a classroom. So that helps offset some of the increases that you see here. So our um, CVSD proposed budget is 82,309, I'm sorry, yes, 398,769. This is a 4.4% change from last year. The cost per equalized pupil, um, which an equalized pupil is um, a fancy um, algorithm that the state figures out, they give weight to our students and they add them up and they divide them out and then they, this is what they give us. Um, is 16,585, which is a 3.2% change. Um, and so I just, there has been information that's been um, presented in two different ways. So I got, I personally got some emails about it and I just wanna make sure that I'm linking those two together. Um, salary, and this is based off of um, what we guess will happen because um, we are currently in negotiations for salary. Um, we believe there will be about a one point, so of the 4.4% increase for the whole budget, 1.3% of the increase from this year to next year will be in salary. So that's our, our, our teachers, our staff, um, everyone. Health insurance, so there's a 4.4% increase, 1.3% between the two years is gonna be health insurance. However, that is a, the number that we're going from this year to, nec to next year's 13.2% increase, but it makes up 1.3% of the increase. Of the increase. Um, special ed is increasing 1.1%. Um, again, I mentioned before that that was, um, it's a 5.2% increase from this year to next year, which for the whole increase accounts for the 1.1%. 0.3% um, is our district initiatives, which is what you saw on the last page. So all those ads um, with the positions that are being removed account for 0.3%. Um, tech center tuition is going up, um, which is like our high school students going to the Burlington Tech or to the Essex Tech. Um, that accounts for 0.2%. Educational supplies, um, those tariffs. They're um, accounting for about 0.2%. Um, other benefits are accounting for 0.1%. And similar to the town, we are also saving some money on debt services for um, the upcoming year, um, which is negative 0.1%, which um, amounts to the 4.4% increase from last year, from this current year to next fiscal year. So tax calculations. <laughs> Um, so we take the, bu the budget expenditures, so the 82 million that we're saying our budget will be. We know, um, I should say, we anticipate revenues of about $13 million. Um, a lot of this comes from Medicaid um, and from the federal government. Um, so the total net spending ends up being just over $69 million. We have an equalized pupil count of 4,176. This is um, a little bit more than we actually have enrolled. Again. It's the algorithm that the state puts our students in and how they weigh them and then they spit them back out. The spending per equalized pupil is 16,585. That's the 3.2% up from this, this current year. The statewide yield, um, so that's what the, the state says that we should be spending per pupil, um, is 10,883. That's 152.4% for district spending adjustment, which equals out to $1.52 for the homestead rate. Um, I, in case you're not as familiar, um, when we um, became a consolidated district, part of us consolidating was um, to give us an incentive. So the first year, we saved 10 cents on our um, homestead rate. The next year was 8%, the next year was 6%, and this, Cents. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, and so this year we still say four cents and eventually we get to zero. Um, so although it's at 1.52, um, we're actually gonna be at $1.48 pre-CLA, um, which I wrote down just so I make sure, common level of assessment. 
Um, this is really hard to read. And what it's basically trying to show you is that um, in 2017, which would have been pre-consolidation, the Williston tax rate was um, right about $1.50. And so this year we'll be coming in at 148, so we're still actually lower than what we were at in 2017. The other lines are confusing because they're for the other towns and they don't actually show them on the bar um, graph. Um, so, this just shows you what happens for Charlotte, Hinesburg, Shelburne, St. George. But for Williston, um, we are at an equalized tax rate for pre-CLA at $1.48. Because of our common level of assessment, so this is the appraisal that the state does on our town, it adjusts us to $1.60. This is a 4.7% change from last year. And what this means is there's a $71.88 increase. Um, and I made sure I did the math. So if you own a $400,000 home in the town of Williston, this means that your taxes will be increasing by $287.52. Um, just to compare our district, um, so the tax commissioner sends out a letter um, at the end of December every year telling us what he expects is happening in the state. Um, and he said the statewide assumption was going to be 5.01%. Our proposed budget is coming in at 4.0%, so it means we're coming in better than um, this, the tax commissioner's letter. Um, we have a change in equalized pupil count. Uh, the estimate was gonna be 0.49%. We have a 0.8%. Um, this is also better, it just means that the state will give us more money. Um, and then growth in spending per equalized pupil, the assumption was 5.53% and we're coming in at 3.2%. So we're coming in under what the, the tax commissioner was assuming would happen for the rest of the state. Um, you may qualify for an education property tax credit for if your household income is less than $138,000, $138, $150. Um, so the, it used to be called the income sensitivity, it's now called the property tax credit, and you can go to www.tax.vermont.gov to see if you qualify. Um, actually, bef okay, I'll finish this and I'll, ask, I'll see if there's any questions before we get into any of the bonds. Um, so this is just what, the, um, what will be on the ballot for tomorrow. Shall the voters of the Champlain Valley School District approve the expenditure of the Board of School Directors of the sum of $82,398,769, which is the amount the Board of School Directors has determined to be necessary for the ensuring fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2020. Um, and it's at this bottom thing in case it's hard to read. It's estimated that the proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of 16,585 per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 3.2% higher than the spending for the current year. I do have a couple bonds I need to discuss, but I, I just wondered if there are any questions about the, um, the larger school board, but the school budget before I continue. Um, so the school, the school district has something called a fund balance. This is essentially money that taxpayers have already paid. It usually um, is that we did better than our budget. So we, uh, we budgeted for a certain amount and then it came, it, we didn't end up spending it all so it goes into this fund balance. And for us to use it, the, um, the voters need to approve it. Um, so we are asking um, that the voters of the Champlain Valley School District authorize the Board of School Directors to allocate its current fund balance without effect upon the district tax levy as follows. Assign $725,000 of the school district's current fund balance as revenue for the 2021 operating budget and assign the remaining balance $1,750,407 $150,407 as revenue for future budgets. So this does not affect our tax rate at all. We have this money currently in a balance and um, by using $725,000 of it, it actually saved us one, one cent on the tax, um, on, the, on the, the tax rate, thank you. Um, so it would have been one cent more if we didn't utilize this, this money. Bus purchases. 
Um, we are currently, we currently have 62 buses in our bus, in our bus fleet. This covers our entire district. Um, our goal is to replace three to four vehicles each year so that we can keep um, the average lifespan of our buses around eight years. We currently have buses that are um, well into the late 20s, um, and I'm not sure if we still have one that's like 30 or 31 years. Um, what's really exciting about this is um, we're asking for three school buses, but um, Champlain Valley School District was awarded um, a grant where if we buy two diesel buses, at, um, if we put up the money for two diesel buses, um, an organization is going to pay the difference, which is about double, for us to get two electric buses. Um, and those will actually all be in the Williston um, schools because we have the best um, current infrastructure to be able to support that. Um, so that's actually something we're really, really excited about, exploring the use of electric buses. Um, so the Champlain Valley School District, shall the voters of the Champlain Valley School District authorize the board of directors to borrow money by the issuance of notes not in excess of $266,000 for the purpose, purchase, purpose of purchasing three school buses. Um, capital maintenance. This is really long, so I'm not going to read it all, but you'll see it on the next slides. Um, we are asking for voters to... Um, Sh shall general obligation bonds or notes of, sh of Champlain Valley School District an amount not exceed $6 million subject to reduction? Okay, I'm not gonna read it all. We're asking for about $6 million um, for a capital maintenance bond, um, which will provide um, $4.5 million to Charlotte Central School, um, and I will explain in a moment what that is for. Um, $445,000 for capital improvements at sh uh, CVU. $395,000 for capital improvements at Hinesburg Community School, $380,000 um, for capital improvements at Shelburne Community School, $90,000 for capital improvements at Allenbrook, um, and then 90000 it's $90,000 for stormwater, um, which anyone who lives in Wilson probably is familiar with what we've been having go on in our state with stormwater. Um, so the CVS board is committed to putting the district on a path to a sustainable capital funding strategy to minimize costs and stabilize tax impacts. We don't want to be coming to taxpayers and asking for $6 million bonds every year. Um, that's not our goal. We're trying to get our buildings in a healthy enough situation where when we do have to ask for bonds, it's every few years and they're small. Um, we have a beautiful building here, which um, which only happened because we took that we took out a bond to work on this school. Um, the same thing happened at Shelburne, and um, the majority of the six million dollar bond is for Charlotte. And if you're not familiar with Charlotte, um, that school is in dire need of um, um, remediation and of major infrastructure. Um, and so what we're hoping to do is to get all of our buildings up to a certain level so that all we're really doing is maintaining, not having to um, constantly put out fires. After a period of catching up, district voters will see consistent small investment requests. There, they would be stewardship bonds um, prioritized to eliminate the need for the large construction projects being seen by some of our neighbors. Um, double or triple digit size bonds are a result of deferring necessary maintenance projects. Um, so when you see a couple pictures of Charlotte, you'll see that's a perfect example of what happens when we defer maintenance. Um, and deferred maintenance also causes health and safety impacts to students and staff, costly secondary facility problems. Um, again, we went and did a tour at Charlotte, and that day they were having to um, pay someone overtime to come in to look at burst pipes because there's no insulation and the pipes froze and burst and if that hadn't been their current environment we wouldn't be paying that. Um, inflation drives cost increases so um, paying 4.5 million dollars now rather than in 10 years um, looks very different just because the cost of material and the cost of labor goes up from year to year and workers comp and insur insurance claims due to accidents and injuries. Um, so again, just to um, highlight, so at CVU, we are um, part of the bond is for $545,000. This is to improve drainage in two of the natural grass fields. Um, they currently, I believe, have five fields, um, and they're not um, 
they have drainage, but it's not at a level that's working. They, um, this past year, our maintenance staff put in some drainage, um, a different type, and it worked really well. And so we want to do two more fields um, with the idea that then the following year we could do another two. Um, th that is not the field that anyone is hoping for a turf field. Um, and resurface the track to meet safety requirements. We're getting to a point that the track is falling into such disrepair, we will no longer probably be able to do track meets in the next year or two. Um, and replace windows in the 1981 wing for energy efficiency. Um, at Hinesburg Community School, which um, accounts for $395,000, um, repaving parking lots and pre replace sidewalks and curbs. Um, this, some of that, um, some of the curb work actually happened at Allenbrook, I believe, last year or the year before. Safety upgrade HVAC and second floor classrooms. At the Shelburne Community School, um, which accounts for $380,000, paved school street parking lot, drop off and pickup area, kitchen uh, mechanicals to code. Um, school security upgrades at Allenbrook School, um, that accounts for $90,000. Um, part of that is um, the sprinkler system, and then the other half is having um, having architects come in and do an assessment of our school um, for safety concerns. If you've never been in Allenbrook, we have an open concept where there are no um, there aren't doors on the classrooms, and so really. Um, the only protection um, of being able to close off a classroom if you want to keep children safe if there is um, a critical in incident happening is closing the doors of a hallway. Um, and so we want to have an architect come in and see what we can do um, to try to make those classrooms safer and see if there's a better way to utilize our space and um, just figure out what that looks like. And um, then district-wide stormwater improvements is $90,000. All schools but Williston fall into the same watershed, and there is a nonprofit that has been matching um, anything we put up. They have been matching that money to um, remediate any stormwater issues, and so we just need to make sure that we have those funds there. And then, of course, if Williston is needing, needing work to be done, we need the, the money for that. Um, and then Charlotte Central School, um, if you've never been to Charlotte Central School, it is um, essentially buildings that have been hobbled together. Um, there's very old buildings. There's been some, um, there's one part that, that was um, actually tore down and um, rebuilt, I think about 12, 2012 maybe. Um, because it was so bad, that part was so bad that they found it was cheaper just to tear it down than try to fix it. Um, and I just want to show some pictures. There was actually way more pictures we could have had, um, and this is just what was put out. So um, what we're talking about is it's not for the whole school. Um, we don't, that would ask for too much money right now. This is for about 70% of the school. Um, the school, the part that we're talking about was a, was a one floor, a one story building. And um, at some point, a second story was built on top. However, they literally built on top of the roof. They put down plywood and then put carpet over that. There was no, there's no insulation. So if you look in this first picture, anywhere you see yellow, um, that is from the outside of the building, that is hot air just coming out. Um, hot air is just leaking out. And um, in the second picture, it's really hard to see, and I apologize that it is, but there are lines going down the whole building because there are metal, um, there's metal and there's just no insulation. And we actually saw, we, when we went inside in the art room, um, the windows are literally just like falling out. They brought us into a couple classrooms where the smell of mold was so strong that I literally looked at Angela and said, if my kindergartner was in this classroom, I think I would pull her and send her to private school. Um, it's just they, what we're asking for the $4.5 million is to change, is to fix the envelope of the building. So this is not to change any of the aesthetics or anything. It is to um, put insulation in the wall. Um, the outside, there's like a stucco on part of the building, which is just literally saturated. Um, so they need to replace that. In some of the um, classrooms, when you go in, you just touch, you just touch the wall and it's ice cold. Um, there are like parts of the building where like water's just like leaking down. It's also to change some of the HVAC um, 
systems right now, and I, I don't know the official terminology for it, maybe um, one of my peers does, but they have like individual heaters in the rooms that are so out, they're, they're completely outdated, but um, they make such a loud, loud, loud noise that the teachers actually choose to turn them off and let the room get cold because um, the students just can't concentrate. It is so loud. They turned one on for us and it, it was just so loud. Um, so the $4.5 million will allow us to um, properly insulate, um, fix the issues with the walls so that water is no longer getting in, um, and to change the HVAC system. Am I missing anything for that? Okay. What? Okay. Um, and then I already spoke to this about Allen Brook. Sorry that I jumped the gun on that. Um, so the fire alarm system and then looking um, about improving our security situation in our open concept school. Um, so tax implications of the bond. The highest tax impact on the bond will be in year two, which is fiscal year um, 2022 to 2023, with principal and interest payments estimated at $426,486. This translates to one cent on the tax rate, or um, if you own a $100,000 home, it's $10. If you own a $500,000 home, it's $50. Um, one caveat I would like to add, and I wish that they had included this slide for us to present to you, is there is currently a CVU bond that will be expiring in the next few years. So although this one will be getting added on, we'll no longer be making that CVU payment, um, and that, that will make a difference um, that year that the CVU bond expires. Um, please vote. Please vote yes um, on the school budget, on the bond for the buses, um, for uh, for the general fund and then for the capital improvement bond. Any questions? Yes, yes sir. Uh, my name is Brian Forrest. I'm the kind of energy coordinator. And uh, the uh, international panel on climate change uh, in 2018 gave us a 2030 to change from carbon, uh, creating from a fossil fuel uh, society to a carbon-free society. Uh, the town is, is starting to address this with the town energy report, and uh, the, the students are responding to it by forming groups like the uh, Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise Movement, and uh, Youth Climate Con uh, Congress here in Vermont. Um, I understand that, that this is a two-way conversation because we do not control your, um, your budget or your, uh, or your actions. I'm asking that the CBU have a conversation, start the conversation about how CBU is going to, uh, how they're going to decarbonize school district. That's it, that's it, uh, talking about um, uh, heating and lighting the schools, the buses, uh, they're all, all cost money, but uh, we spend $23 million, we spend $23 million a year to the school district to educate our children. We need to have a, a plan for a planet for them to live on uh, once they graduate. Thank you, I can definitely bring that to our board as a point of discussion. And I would say that, you know, the, the um, renovation or construction that was done here at Wilson Central School was very much focused on efficiency upgrades and um, improving our uh, environmental, you know, the output of the building itself. Um, same is true for the Charlotte Central School renovation. And of course, um, if you could just see the our Jean Jensen's excitement, the, uh, the two electric bus. Bus. she told us that we got the grant for the electric buses. So there's definitely excitement around the topic. And um, as you mentioned, of course, student generated interest. And so yes, it is, uh, it can certainly be a focus for us moving forward. Thank you. Chapin Kaner, and maybe everybody knows this, but as I understand it, the 19 million or so that we bonded to make to bring Wilson Central up to, to where it is, um, that debt is part of the CVSD now. And so, although this year's request is mostly for other schools, the total debt load on the district is not unbalanced. Am I, is that an accurate statement? Chapin, thank you for uh, bringing that up. Um, that is actually, so this is the second time I've done this presentation. The first time was at um, the Williston, Williston's Family as Partners, so that's our um, local PTA. 
again, a little plug if you want to get involved. Um, and that was one of the, the discussion points is that we benefited with consolidation when we got our bond. Um, I actually believe that only Williston voters actually voted on that bond, but then with the consolidation, all the towns um, bear the cost. And, um, and so kind of, you know, the mentality I would hope that other people in Williston would be thinking is, I mean, we got, this school is beautiful and, and we got some much needed improvements and now it's our turn to help oh, another one of our schools. Um, and I, I, I've only been on the school board for two years, so I know that I've kind of come at it from a, a certain perspective because I don't really know the district is anything but being consolidated, but really, even though it's even though four point five million dollars is for Charlotte, really, I mean, it's for our whole school district. I mean, there are schools; all of them are our schools. All of those kiddos go into CVU. They they all get they all get um, mixed together. So, Chief, and thank you for um, for making that point. Yes, Greg. I'll just throw out another point, and that is that um, one of the reasons we require a nineteen point eight million dollar budget a bond to address the issues in this facility is because of years of deferred maintenance. The, you know, you do what you can each year under your maintenance budget, but there are big ticket items that you need to address that fall outside of what a maintenance, an annual maintenance budget can handle. That's why I'm really encouraged about this um, proactive, smaller bonds in terms of stewardship and keeping things at a level of maintenance where we're not gonna be facing 12, 15, 25 million dollar proposals that are required because of different maintenance. So that's one of the reasons we had such a big ticket on this building. And um, our district is very fortunate to have Jean Jensen as our COO. Um, she's, I really feel like she's a visionary and really uh, thinks long term. And um, so we, we need to put some money into Charlotte. There will probably still be some money that needs to be put into the other schools as well. But if we can get to a point where all the schools are in at least fighting shape, then we can get to the point that we're only asking for small stewardship bonds every few years. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Please tell all your friends, vote yes, 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 and yes. Thank you. <laughs>